I want to follow up what I started asking David and uh, in the hallway, and that is uh, all your localization and analysis is done with these GFP, RFP fusions, and the question is how much are they functionally compromised and how do you evaluate whether they're functionally compromised? In budding yeast, we have, so since my lab does both, we have much more sensitivity because you, you, usually the cell, usually you can make it easily the only copy of the whatever gene, and especially you know about its what phenotypes there are from loss of function you can look for or genetic interactions. Um, as I mentioned in the hallway, even a, I think that it, you always compromise function when you put a tag on a protein, and I think people try to sweep that under the rug, but you know it varies. I think in most cases you preserve the function surprisingly you know well. Um, but there are things you can do, like assess the pa pathway. If you're looking at endocytosis, you can check your line and make sure the rates of endocytosis are normal. You can look at different components of a complex and see if they have similar behavior. Um, I think you always need to be cautious when... You said you've generated like 120 lines now. <laughs> Yeah, well, many more yeast. That's mammalian lines, yeah. Yeah, mammalian, you know, it's, um, they're diploid, so do you tag, if you tag, or if they're HeLa cells, they have six, you know, copy, it, how many copies you tag, it can definitely make a difference, and the, actually the Allen Institute, so I'm a something senior investigator, whatever, I have some role at the Allen Institute where they're doing this very systematically and very rigorously, they find that um, for some genes, they, they don't recover any diploid. You know, where both alleles are edited, they only get single allele edited, which is, uh, and a guess is that it's because it might be lethal to edit both, or at least select it against some kind of growth disadvantage. So in that case, actually, what we've done in mammalian cells and what the Allen Institute tries to do is to go to experts in the field who have, like, leave it to experts to study a process if you tag a protein because the Allen Institute doesn't have expertise in all the different cellular processes, they might go to your lab and say, what would you tag in the proteasome or something like that, you know, and what, what evidence do you have that that was functional? But things like what linker you use can make a huge difference night and day. Um, so it definitely it is deserving of care. They're trying to do to just tag systematically, systematically tag all the the Allen Institute, they're, they are tagging. So you can go to their web page, the Allen Institute for Cell Science. Uh, it's too bad Leonard isn't here. I meant to mention to him, they have, they, put, they have tons of 3D imaging data for all these proteins. It's all the raw data is put on the web immediately. So people who have the computational skills can look at the images. But they are doing... Um, they, are, they originally were going to try to tag essentially everything, but they decided instead to be very to thoroughly characterize all their cell lines and instead make representatives. So every major organelle uh, is tagged already. Every major cytoskeletal element, cell adhesion molecules. Now they're working on signal transduction proteins, and they're all going to be in the same genetic background, and it's all available to the public at their cost. At, the, their cost. So Berkeley has acquired the first set as a resource for people on campus. And, you know, it's a lot, I think, like model organisms, C. elegans or flies, where you have, so everybody in different labs, you know, is comparing the same type of cell, um, which, you know, now I know in my field, if my, even if my lab works on a HeLa cell and the lab down the hall works on HeLa cells, they are not at all the same. HeLa cells, it's not even close to a real cell. Yeah, exactly. So that's, you know, so that's, you know, it's time to, you know, to start working on things that are more physiological. Does it mean that uh, rapidly we will have somehow among the old cell biology lab to use this kind of uh, cells to be sure to publish, for instance? So is it, is it to be sure, I mean, somehow that everybody is, is, is talking on the same base? So is it, it would be a trend like that? I think it would be a, a positive trend. Yeah, I think it's not bad. I just, I mean, I'm not in charge of all, of any, you know, all cell biology. Uh, to Mark's question, uh, 
the GF no, ah, the, <laughs> GFP is a very stable protein. Uh, so when you make a fusion, you could stabilize short-lived protein. And this could have an effect which is not natural. That stable short-lived protein could be stable. Uh, so this could be a, a little bit of a problem. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> it's just the only, the, it's, one, it's a way to look. Yeah. No, but you can test. You can test. You can look at the half-life and test. Around the system, yeah. not by over ex gene expression, but right. stabilization. Sure. <laughs> Are you using monomeric sure. GFP or? Yes. Okay. Yes. Question. And we try also, sorry, we try also to, like when mm -hmm. we see something with GFP, to, to see if it's really true also with immunofluorescence, right, the, where, it, where it's, no, a, it's endogenous. This was done to it's overcome the overexpression, but it's not always going to do that. Yeah. Sure. Okay, somebody wanted to say something yeah. like... No, I have the question. Yeah, yeah no, but my point, uh, comment, <coughs> GFP is, is, of course, is good, but uh, well, there, is, there is a choice uh, of different tags as well, like uh, Halo tags or Snap tags or so. They have uh, big advantages, like you can use the floor for you want, for whatever kind of experiment, photoxidation, or, or fret, it's much more efficient with with these tags here. So I wonder why GFP is older. So maybe it was chosen because the project was started some time ago. But not sure that today I will choose GFP. Yeah, I mean we use all those tags, and some people like the 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 um, Cell Atlas, the Chan Zuckerberg Cell Atlas. They're we using like split GFP. Okay, the, the the Chan Zuckerberg is doing sort of the opposite approach of the Allen Institute. Um, there's this new center, Chan Zuckerberg, so all these rich people are starting institutes now the, in the US. And so they, um, they're they using this split GFP where you put an 11 amino acid tag and then you, you just use a cell, a parent cell line that expresses the rest of the GFP. It makes a beta barrel, so one of the, yeah, so it, and then so that's a smaller tag, but it makes GFP. So there's pros and cons of different things. We had a question in the back first. Uh, after that, we'll be enough. Uh, mine is a very general one outside of the field, and I guess mainly Judith, Alberto, maybe the others. Uh, so the transport complexes have been studied mainly in the context of their original mutant phenotypes. In other words, they interrupt one step in some transport pathway. We're now starting to find them in more places. I guess from a person who's interested in more regulatory mechanisms, I'm curious how general this sort of multifunctional combinatorial mechanism is going to be. And also, we've learned quite a bit about signaling out from the transport complexes, from uh, unfolded proteins and such. How about signaling in? I mean, what do we know about signals going into the transport machineries? Which parts of the signaling machinery are regulated by what kinds of mechanisms? So the first question, uh, I think uh, multitasking proteins, it's an emerging team and, and, and the list of, of proteins that are known to have m multiple tasks is growing. Also some proteins that we know very long already, uh, for example, I have been talking about the menos 6 phosphate receptor uh, that is involved in transport of lysosomal enzymes, but it is also involved in endocytosis of IGF-2. Um, and and, and, and it is the fields that are looking at IGF-2 uh, endocytosis of menos 6 phosphate receptor trafficking are kind of apart, strangely enough, but it's the same uh, receptor. Um, and for signaling, um, for example, um, VPS3 uh, was um, so part of the core of it. Uh, was originally identified as TGFB rep one, and it's a SMET4 binding protein, uh, and that is involved in the TGF beta signaling pathway. Um, so that is what I know. Uh, but I think that that we have to be very open. Uh, to this, that, that, that one protein can have multiple functions. You want to add? No, no, 
I, I, think, I agree. I think it's uh, sort of disturbing. It would be much uh, easier to think one function, one protein, but these moonlighting proteins appear to be very many, actually. I, but I don't think, I don't know of any systematic database or systematic study or collection of data about this moonlighting phenomenon. You find a lot of this in the literature. So I guess there are many, but uh, there is nothing systematic and clear done already. So for your question about the signaling, trafficking, and coupling, I think Google 4 translocation is a very good example. Um, so it's well known AS160 can be phosphorylated by AKT in the insulin signaling possibly, but that's just a part of the story. So David James did a whole uh, proteomic analysis and found uh, hundreds of protein uh, could be uh, phosphorylated upon insulin stimulation and it is still open uh, are these uh, phosphorylations important or not uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a long way uh, at least uh, there are some candidates so far can I just add my pennies for I think what you're asking uh, to me uh, it's it's it depends on exactly what your question is. A RAB is going to do the same no matter where it is. It's going to function with a different set of proteins. An escort 3 complex makes filaments, no matter whether it does it at the surface, whether it does it at cytokinesis, or whether it does it at the surface of an endosome. It might interact with different components. So the signals don't make a circle into a square. It still remains a signal but it can change its interactors based on where it is. A COP2 coat will make a COP2 vesicle because it only functions at the ER. These are the hard-wired nuts and bolts. SEC61 will only translocate cargos or, or, or newly synthesized proteins at the ER. It will not do it at endosomes, for example. So you have to ask the question based on the protein you're interested in, uh, and that can change. Okay. But certain com proteins do not change their location no matter what you do to them, and they don't become something else just because they get a phosphorylation event or a glycosylation event. But maybe an easy way to, to solve this issue is to distinguish between the activity of a protein and Precisely. its function. Precisely. Because an enzyme is an enzyme. Have one activity, eventually two, like an enzymatic activity or a scaffold yeah. activity. But this. Yeah. An enzyme will remain. Many functions, yeah. and depending on the cell type and localization, it can have many, yeah, many outputs. But when you're looking at, at different pathways in the cells, the, the same function may influence very different processes. Well, if you look also, um, Charlie Boone doesn't seem to be in the room, but he his uh, genetic interaction network, uh, you know, I think, I can't remember that the essential proteins, I don't know, had nine interactions each, the non-essential seven, something like that, you know, which, so each protein ha does have many different types of interaction, don't functional interactions, and you, similarly, when you do proteomics, you know, I, I forget the average protein it pulls out seven other binding proteins, and so, well, yeah. I guess there is a, you know, some core hard definition of moonlighting proteins. They have completely different functions, and they use different surfaces for these functions. So that those are really completely different activities. Um, I work with a protein which is involved in membrane fission. It's also a transcription factor, exactly the same problem. You and the molecular mechanism is very well known. The surfaces are different, and the functions are totally different. And there are a few examples. As I said before, it's not clear how many cases of this real multifunctional proteins uh, we have. But from the literature, I guess uh, so. It's not just the change of you know of localization. And the same protein, the same enzymatic activity does something in a compartment and has a different effect in another compartment that's not a multifunctional protein. Uh, but Alberto, I beg to differ. Sorry. Your protein bars 
is recruiting an acyl transferase in doing the fission process. And when it's inside the nucleus, it recruits an acetyl transferase to, his, to acetylate. No, 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 no the, it's really very well known. It's completely different. Why? I mean, does it no. not recruit? There are many examples like that. No. Huh? No, but I can simply, it's, it's not the case. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not true. It's not true. No, it doesn't recruit an acyl transferase in, in the nucleus. <laughs> does it have, we have there, are, there are many it examples, like, like one lighting activity. So there are very few examples of those. Very, no, very no, few. no, many. Glycolytic <laughs> enzyme could form a function in the nucleus, the transcription factor, for example. Or cytochrome C. Yeah, cytochrome C. And many times the name of a protein, you know, the, the, the history influences how people think about it. Which function was discovered first? No, there's a canonical function, and then the moonlighting activity was discovered afterwards. And sometimes it's, it's like you're not even sure if it's tr real or not, if it's direct or indirect. The question is how many of these moonlighting prote uh, proteins really shown to, to directly be involved in two into totally different functions. I don't know. Mm. No, I, Alberto wants to say. As I said, I don't, One, uh, I, I don't know how many. And also, uh, definition of moon, the definition, uh, the criteria should be strict. Otherwise, okay, a protein can do many things. Uh, it should be strict. Different surfaces, completely different activities. Then, uh, under those criteria, I'm not sure how many there are, but Several, I think. Would you call VPS 3A a moonlighting protein? Uh, I don't know enough. Um, maybe not. I'm not I'm, I don't know what it does, actually. Uh, no, it's not completely. We know. Already, so I, I can't yeah. answer that. No. Um. So all of you guys are working with cell membranes in some way or another, and I think a few of you were asked about lipids, and none of you talked about lipids, and I'm wondering how you feel about them, <laughs> both in the, <laughs> maybe why it's not relevant to your research, or how maybe it is, and how you're interested in that or not. Repeat the why, first, why, why first few you, seconds. Why don't you talk about lipids in your... Lipids. Oh, talking about lipids today. Uh, uh, no, because <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Patricia and I talked about, li about yeah, lipids a lot, but it was privately. <laughs> I don't... Okay. Not because... <laughs> it, uh? It was so... Uh, no, no, no. It's a completely different story. It's, it's, it's not related to this meeting. <laughs> I think one of the things that limit, uh, there are many things that limit studies in, in the lipid field. One is that you can't monitor them in cells, uh, where they are, their dynamics, their exact position of the different species. The same way that can be done with, with proteins. You can label them and monitor exactly their dynamics. That's a huge advantage, and I think people got two Nobel Prizes. For lipids, it's a completely, you know, there is no way. It's a completely unexplored territory. Uh, so um, imaging is impossible. It's, it's a big, big limitation. And uh, biochemistry can be done, but uh, of course uh, can be done. But again, without imaging, you don't know where they are. And for cell biologists, it's, it's a big uh, question that can't be answered. So Tommy is not here. But yesterday he used, I, I think people are using, to look at the lipids, at phospholipids, phospho, it, to use domains of proteins that recognize the lipids specifically. Yeah, of course. But, but, but they sequester lipids. Yeah. You know, so one has to be careful. But, you, no, but answering his question. There are being lipids that are being studied extensively, but they are usually modified lipids, phosphor inositides, for example, yeah. the PIPs, the PIP2s, and the PIP3s, yeah. diacylglycerols. They've been studied extensively. But you're talking about 
lipids that are present in all the membranes, you know, the phosphatidylcholines and the serines and ethanolamines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are present in all the membranes. What changes uh, is the concentration and their production at any given time. And that becomes very difficult to quantitate. You cannot easily manipulate them. And if you use these kinds of proteins, uh, such as a pH domain of a protein that binds to a phosphoinositide, sure, you can monitor it, but you don't know what you do to the dynamics because you have bound something and you prevent its consumption. And there is there for that little caveat that you have to be careful. Um, and that is probably one of the major reasons. People think that those methods are not reliable. You can monitor lipids, one with lipid binding proteins, but then you, know, you mess up completely the dynamics of that lipid. Or you can replace an acyl, uh, an acyl uh, moiety with uh, a fluorescent molecule, like a body pie or something. But again, it's not the same molecule. So people, don't, uh, including myself, people don't trust those, those data, basically. Now, th there is, things might change now with uh, the advent of um, uh, imaging mass spec, mass spectrometry. Uh, that's going to reach a resolution, it has already, but it's not commercial yet, uh, of one square micron. And you can identify 300, 300 400 lipid species uh, using uh, imaging mass specs. So then you can, you know, have big, you have big pixels, but you can get an image there. And the resol molecular resolution is fantastic. You can distinguish many different species of phosphatidyl choline, for instance, because they differ in length of the acyl uh, moieties. So that's uh, going to come. It's, it's here already, basically. Uh, okay, so going off of what Vivek said, and, and I was thinking about during David's talk about the, the math modeling of the, the endosome formation or whatever, I was curious <laughs> whether you took into, I mean, did you take into account the concentration of the different kinds of lipids that could be there and that how that affects the elasticity of the membrane or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, we just uh, varied parameters that you know to do with the membrane tension. We treat in for those most of those models we used. Uh, we just um, modeled the lipid bilayer as an elastic sheet, and then varied the properties of that sheet, and didn't change anything locally, which probably happens during these processes. So that would be a refinement. You know that in terms of budding and fusion, you're cutting membranes and you're fusing membranes, and there is no space for lipids in snare-mediated fusion event, and there is no space for um, COP2 and COP1-mediated cutting. Why? Because it's just been very, very difficult. And in vitro, people kind of don't ever get to measure those things, and in vivo, it's very difficult because unlike proteins where you can do siRNA and CRISPR and quantitate, you can't really do that with lipids. So it's um, it's been a technical challenge, not because of lack of interest or not wanting to study yeah. it. Well, we heard exactly with uh, Dr. Sherfield this morning, she is not here, exactly this conversation. She is doing experiments. We are also doing experiments with liposomes and changing the composition of liposomes and looking at how this changes the response of certain proteins. It can be done in liposomes. You control the lipid composition, you know what's, what's there. But when you want to translate this data into in vivo in cell biology, you have no idea what's going on there. That's, that's a big limitation, essentially. Yeah. Uh, no, it was. I was going to say that I find it great to this initiative to go to the primary cell and try to redefine in terms of endocytosis and maturation of endocytic compartment, how in primary cells and not in HeLa cell this is happening. Because most of what was found in HeLa cell turns out to not apply to the primary cell. However, I, I wanted to have your opinion on, on how much could you estimate how much of what you're going to find in the cells you're using uh, which are not really primary, actually, from what I understand, yeah. uh, is going to be ge general, general, possible to be generalized. Because my feeling is that 
when it comes to endocytosis, uh, an endocytic vesicle, it's always defined by what it contains. And since all the cells have different activity in terms of receptor and internalization and in, in, in tissues, finally, could we, can we really find general rules on endocytosis and endocytic trafficking in, in general? That's the question I ask myself. Well, so what do you tell yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? So, no, I said you ask yourself, so what do you answer? <laughs> I mean, my, we've just looked at one process, and we've found that it, it's remarkably different. You know, so if you look at the literature in endocytosis, different papers using, you know, cancer cell lines report very different morphological features for endocytic sites, plaques or round vesicles, uh, very dynamic, very slow. Um, and it's hard to make sense of whether those differences, how those differences came about are they physiologically relevant? Because if they are relevant, then they're likely to be important, and then there's some kind of mechanism that adapted that, that process for the different cell types. And I think if you extrapolate to all the different cell types, and then looking in the context of a, of a tissue where you have cell-cell contacts, apical, basolateral surfaces, there's going to be differences that you just wouldn't be able to see when you look at things on glass. Um, and then the fact that you can differentiate them into many different cell types. And I think these organoids are, they're imperfect now, like they, they don't have a vascular system, but there's just so much effort into um, improving them that there's gonna be a huge push in that direction. So you know, I think all these things are complementary. I think the Tommy thing, looking in zebrafish, which are very translucent and you can look in a living animal, a lot of intracellular events. Um, those are all good things to do. No, but this is a general, a general problem. There are around 300 types of cells in, in mammalians, and they, okay, some basic DNA polymerase will be probably the same in all of them. But uh, as soon as you get a little bit away from these very, very core basic functions, there is obviously a lot of difference among cell types. So that's a, a also a big problem when you start to look into the physiology. Uh, you know, the, uh, then physiology means uh, th that cell type in that organ, in, those, in that context. It, we are not there. I mean, it's going to take many, many, many years to, to get there. Oh, it's possible to make transgenic mice with tag protein. No, sure, but it's it's a huge amount of work, uh, se <laughs> centuries of work. But, but listen, no, it I is possible. No, just yeah, just. Uh, but uh, listen, you this this love affair with transgenic mice. You know, this, if you do a if you do a mucin uh, uh, PubMed, you get I think something like uh, fifteen thousand papers or ten thousand papers, and a lot of this has been done in mice. In fact, the whole cystic fibrosis model based on the mouse system turns out to be a complete flop because the human goblet cells of the airways are different from the goblet cells of the gut. We work on this blasted problem. Yeah. And we followed the mouse wallace for, for years, and it turns out the, the way the uh, airways goblet cells work in our system is completely different and has nothing to do with what happens in a mouse. I'm talking about but some, some of the issues you can. So th coming back to the original question raised by the fellow up there in blue shirt, that some of the questions, for example, you asked about generalization. Well, we know that basic mechanism or basic principle of endocytosis and exocytosis is conserved in yeast and in us. So some of the things are going to be conserved and there are no changes to be expected. Ah, there might be modules. You know, but the basic concept is the same. The cops do the same thing in yeast and flies and worms and, and in us. Um, but there are certain things that yeast just does not do. I mean, they don't have bones, they don't spit, you know, um, and they don't think. So of course, studying those things in yeast is liable to give you wrong, might take you in the wrong direction. So it all boils down to what is it that you want to study, what you're capable of doing, and how far do you want to stretch it? Lipids are not studied by many of us because it's blasted difficult to get at it, you know, whereas other things are relatively easy, relatively, not easy, but they're just relatively easy. And people who work on proteosomes and things of that kind, they don't have to worry about it. There are no membranes. You know, they just 
pure blob of proteins. <laughs> pure blobs of proteins, you know, so you could get away with it. So I think it's picking your problem carefully and knowing how far you can take it. It's very important. Are we done? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hold the microphone. Oh, and unless somebody wants to say something about the no, previous no, question. No, no, no. Just. Uh, uh. For instance, in Germany, they have a, a, an enormous alliance to study liver cells, the liver and liver cells. So all the data are understandable, comparable in one system. But otherwise, discussing processes like signaling, for instance, rendocytosis in different animals, in different cell types, is dangerous. One needs to know that. <laughs> That's all. He was going to, he had a really philosophical... Please, David, <laughs> he, he was complaining, he, uh, he keeps asking, is this over? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vivek, you answer one more question and then you can go, just you. <laughs> so, what do you think are the big questions that you still want to see answered in this field? In life? <laughs> no. In, in what? In your, oh, in your life? Yeah. In your life... <laughs> Oh, no, really, what's no the idea. thing? I mean, we know the pathways, we know the mechanisms. No, so we don't know the pathways. I think this is it. We don't? So what I is mean, the question? You know, the, uh, the popes go around telling the world that you know everything about uh, pro the, the trafficking business, so you shouldn't be worrying about it. I mean, I'm sure David gets beaten to jelly that, don't we know everything about actin? And it turns out, well, no, not really. Why, what, what is it that we don't know? We don't know how actin can do what it does in so many different forms. And it's, it's the same thing. If you just study VSVG transport, or if you just look at invertase secretion, then it's kind of, yeah, maybe it's over. But if you want to look at the real stuff, then we have no understanding. And the question is, do you want to just say, well, we kind of know the basics, so it's over? Or you want to say, no, it isn't. I mean, if you were to talk to George Pallotti when he was alive, he used to say, Sometimes, not always. The same. Don't we already know everything yeah. about... Jim Hoffman said in five years, yeah. we'll already figure out everything out. Exactly. So we so haven't. We don't. So, so the question no. is, do we want to know more players? You're suggesting, you know, that we don't... Pick a problem and solve it, whether it requires new players, knowing lipids, knowing doing stuff in organoids, doing stuff in, uh, you know, whatever. Just solve it at whatever the level. I mean, it's simple as that. I think uh, I have, of course, an opinion here. Yeah. <laughs> now, it, this, you know, it's been around, the, the answer has been around for too long, and it's complexity. Uh, what we don't understand is, is the complexity of the biological system. That systems biology. We have been talking about systems biology for 20 years or so, and it's been disappointing, I think. It's, the thing is, it, that's the real problem, and it has taken a lot of time, and it's going to take more time, but it's, it's the real frontier for the next, I think, 10 or 20 years, complexity. Well, com I think it's clear what complexity means. No, it's uh, the si how the systems work, not uh, the, the nuts and bolts. Well, now that you mentioned uh, Jim Rossman, well, he, he's a person trying to simplify everything. Um, I remember he mentioned once autophagy. He think it's just a one branch of a secretary pathway. I'm not sure if Mark heard about that. Um, but in the end, it was much more complicated than that, right? They earned a Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So my opinion, probably going to be many, many, not only players, but also pathways. We just don't know, right? I think so, Jim mentioned that autophagy is just another way to degrade proteins. He, he, he didn't say that it's, you know, another form of, you know, assembling compartments. You know, the idea that you use ubiquitin to then tag proteins and then you to clear them in lysosomes. You know, one could argue that this was shown by Chikanover and Hershko and Warshavsky. But I agree that what Osumi did, he basically came up with a whole pathway and it turns out that this pathway is so crucial for so many physiological processes. This goes beyond just doing this inside a cell and throwing it into a container. That is not the case. Um, so, you know, he, he can say whatever. We also said openly that protein transfer, ah, we kind of know everything about it. And it's not true. But I think if you challenge him, one-on-one, -on -one, he would admit that we don't even know when a vesicle fuses 
you, a vesicle is fusing to the target membrane and there is this pore that expands. How that pore expands is not clear and it's a very major issue. So I think it's, you know, when you talk, it sort of loose talk is very easy and you can say, yeah, we kind of know everything. Oh, People yeah. say the same thing about transcription and yeah. every time you find out, geez, the we question didn't. question is what do you want to know about the biological system? Do, for instance, Randy Shackman says, I want to understand it at the atomic level. I'm not interested in the atomic level. I think it's fantastic, but I'm, uh, I think what I need is enough knowledge to predict the behavior of the system when we perturb it. Uh, so that probably means uh, dynamic relationships between um, edges and nodes, and then you have to define them better. But the ability to predict responses quantitatively when we perturb a system, that's what we want to know. And uh, well, that's uh, I think this is this is the problem. <laughs> it's like a physical approach. No, physical. So you have a uh, just a comment on uh, on what you just a comment on what you said uh, and the systems biology and complexity. I think that uh, uh, systems biology will continue to be disappointing uh, for uh, many years because we just don't know enough. And that's the whole point. Uh, so I want to agree with uh, with the panel that uh, we we are still st still scratching the surface of uh, of many. We're still getting a lot of surprises in terms of functions and moon likings and, and all the rest of it. But in terms of, of protein uh, activities and functions, and uh, and so on the other hand you have to start somewhere and you have to start trying so if you go into systems biology you know you're prone to fail but there's small advances that will eventually catch up yeah. but it's you know that just just trying to get a model of one simple cell and and, and a mathematical model of a simple cell to predict behavior that's the, that's the ultimate goal but we're, we're so far away from 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 that uh, because uh, our technology is just not uh, not, not there and, uh, and, and 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 we're just ignorant in that. so i think we started talking about systems and systems biology far too early so it was bound to be a big disappointment but i think it's the it's the way And, uh, and, yeah. and drugs. It's the same principle. You just don't know enough about the system, so you cannot predict. If you could predict, uh, uh, the pharma uh, systems uh, would be a lot more efficient than, than they exactly. are. And, and that's the whole But thing. you keep making drugs, right? Well, yes. <laughs> but, so that's, again, uh, uh, it's not the reason why there shouldn't be pharma companies. Uh, uh, it's, uh, and, and, and we're achieving some success. It's exactly the same with systems biology. You're achieving a, a little bit of success, but you cannot expect that, that you solve the whole thing. Yeah. Then the mathematicians will come eventually to save us. Uh, when That's you know what the left. One of the problems of systems biology is that there is a divide, a separation between modelers, mathematicians, and real biologists, let <laughs> say real biologists. It's important really to fuse, uh, to, to know exactly what a model means in terms of the molecule, the function you are familiar with. Otherwise, it's going to be models, for what? And the classical nuts and bolts, uh, bolts uh, cell biology. This is... Uh,